So here I am, uh, feeling like Rip Van Winkle and looking like something from a storage closet in a museum. So it's an honor to speak uh, to this symposium and, and quite a surprise, both to be asked after so many years, try that again, okay, yeah, all right, okay, um, <clears throat> Both be asked after so many years, and that the subject is still active at this late date. I've been asked to reflect on the past 40 years, what has changed, what has stayed the same, what changes still need to happen, and what steps need to occur to bring about change. That's all. <laughs> the first task, what has changed, is in some ways the easiest and certainly the most uplifting. Almost everything has changed, and all for the good, beginning with the priesthood revelation of 1978. The obvious milestones, aside from the revelation itself, are the immediate ordination of blacks to the priesthood, soon including the office of high priest, and the resumption of temple ordinances. Just 12 years after the revelation, the first black general authority, and recently two more. An inner city proselyting effort, African American state presidents in the Deep South, the growth of the black membership from perhaps a few thousand to somewhere over half a million. Africa deserves a special mention. In 1980, the church permanently entered black Africa through a mission to Nigeria. There now are 26 African missions, not counting three in South Africa. LDS stakes have been established in at least five African countries other than South Africa. LDS temples are operating under African leadership and are under construction in four African countries. Africans from Zimbabwe and Kenya have been called as general authorities. These developments, individually and collectively, far exceed what I thought possible in 1973. The most conspicuous remaining shortfall is that after 37 years, there still is no African American <coughs> general authority. The church has made available a truly unprecedented amount of primary source material, well beyond what was available even during Leonard Arrington's tenure as church historian. As one who faced major obstacles to research during the Joseph Fielding Smith era, I'm now amazed that material that was totally inaccessible not that long ago is now readily available even via the internet. I'm thinking here of the Joseph Smith papers and the general church minutes from 1839 to 1877, and before that, but well after my research and the priesthood revelation, the Journal of Wilford Woodruff, and indirectly the diaries of David O. McKay. Most early church periodicals are now in searchable formats online, so I can do what previously was laborious on-site research from the comfort of my own study, and even download what I find directly into word processing software. In the early 1970s, I was thankful that I had an electric typewriter, e even without a correcting capability. <laughs> when I found a mistake, I was always thankful it was at the top of the page, so I didn't have to retype the whole thing. Beyond this, there are now scores of scholarly studies online, all illuminating aspects of the history of blacks in the church. These are transformative developments. For better or worse, the internet has made it impossible for history to recede invisibly into the past. Unlike the case 75 or more years ago, our previous record now lives on, and often it's just a few clicks away. In terms of new understanding, over the past four decades, a near avalanche of insightful books and articles has been published. I once assembled a selected bibliography on blacks in the priesthood, which included 97 items published between 1900 and 1973. Over 90% of that group had appeared in the 23 years since 1950, and two-thirds in just the eight years since 1965. So that's from 65 to 73. If anything, since 1973, this attention has intensified. Between 1978 and 1980, for example, there were 18 comparably significant publications 30 in the 1980s, 24 in the 1990s, and another 36 since 2000. Altogether, 
118 notable books and articles since 1973, and some of the most important are just now being published. In retrospect, it's turned out that back in 1973, I had enough information to correctly work out the basic outline of the history of the priesthood ban. But publications since then also have cast new light on the early history, in addition to highlighting the lives of contemporary black Mormons and detailing the church's entry into Africa. Some of this new information was published soon after 1973, but important material has continued to appear, particularly during this past decade. The remarkable faith of black Mormons Samuel D. Chambers and Jane James and the problematic behavior of William McCary and Winter Quarters were first illuminated in the 1970s. And there were studies on early black priesthood holders, Elijah Abel and Walker Lewis. The 80s and 90s were dominated by publications on the church in Africa and contemporary black Latter-day Saints. But then the most comprehensive priesthood related studies to date have appeared just within the past decade. These include studies on Walker Lewis, another early black priesthood holder named Joseph Ball, several lengthy works on Elijah Abel, and on some notable race-related parallels between Mormon policy and that of Freemasonry. Even now, the first book-length studies of church policy since 1981 are being published. Returning to what I once thought of as the modern era, the late 1960s, when I did some of my most intense research was a period of relative openness within the church. Those years spawned dialogue, the Mormon History Association, and ultimately the calling of Leonard Arrington as church historian. I remember an article carried by the church's instructor magazine, just as this era was beginning. It was about Tracy Y. Cannon, who for 23 years was chairman of the church's general music committee. I liked it because it said what it did in a church publication. According to the article, Cannon faced recurring problems because some church policies, quote, did not result in the highest artistic result in church music. However, when he became discouraged and was inclined to give up, the impression would come to him that he had died and was standing before the Lord answering for his lack of action. When he explained that, quote, I was following the policy set by those in authority, the Lord always responded, quote, but Tracy, you knew better. You don't see that in a publication anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> to be clear, in 1973, I didn't believe I knew better on the subject of blacks and the priesthood. I did think I knew the history better than what had been published to that point, both pro and con church teachings. That didn't mean I thought my 1973 article would end the priesthood ban. Instead, I thought it would lead to the historical department of the church being tasked to develop the story more fully. It was disappointing to learn from talks with Elder Packer at that time that this was not going to happen. And only later did I learn that the historical department actually had been barred from working on the priesthood question. More positively, I soon learned that many of the general authorities had read my article <coughs> and was not surprised that there was a very mixed response. I was told by one general authority that it had stirred the pot and made an impact that would not be acknowledged. Only recently did I learn that at some point President Kimball had studied it carefully and extensively marked it up. But it really wasn't until decades later that church historians and their consultants finally did study the history of blacks and the priesthood in some detail, as I had hoped would happen in the 70s. Since 1978, the progression of President Kimball's thinking on the priesthood has, been, has received some attention, though without his own first-hand account, the story is still conjectural. His son, Edward, included then Apostle Kimball's 1963 comments and a letter to Edward in the teachings of Spencer W. Kimball published in 1982. In it, the elder Kimball observed that, this is what Paul just said, quote, the prophets for 133 years of the church have maintained the position of the prophet of the restoration, 
that the Negro could not hold the priesthood and nor have the temple ordinances which are preparatory for exaltation. Then he added, quote, I know the Lord could change his policy and release the ban and forgive the possible error which brought about the deprivation. While this suggests an unexpected degree of flexibility on Kimball's part, had I known of it, I would have believed it more likely that he was simply reflecting back language contained in the question posed to him by his son. In August 1970, when I spoke with Kimball, who then was the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve, he seemed quite confident that the legitimacy about the legitimacy of the priesthood ban and quoted the Book of Abraham as the basis. Kimball's son, Edward, said that even within the family, Kimball always responded to questions about policy and doctrine with traditional orthodox explanations. Then in December 1973, soon after becoming the 12th president of the church, Kimball responded to a reporter's question on blacks in the priesthood, quote, I'm not sure that there will be a change, although there could be. We are under the dictates of our Heavenly Father and this is not my policy or the church's policy. It is the policy of the Lord who has established it. And I know of no change, although we are subject to revelations in the Lord, to, of the Lord in case he should ever wish to make a change. He responded very similarly just over two months later in an interview on NBC's Today Show. He did not anticipate a change in the racial policy. He said, if it should be done, the Lord will reveal it. Despite those conservative responses, it's clear from what little has become public that President Kimball soon was intensely focused on the priesthood ban. In 1975, he distributed to his counselors in the first presidency a collection of statements on the subject by early church leaders and asked for their reactions. He later did the same thing with the Quorum of the Twelve. In June 1977, he asked at least three general authorities to give him papers on the subject, including two of the band's strongest supporters, Apostles Bruce McConkie and Boyd Packer. Apostle Dallin Oaks also recalls being asked by Kimball for his views about that time, says Kimball talked to dozens of people. One of these was Jack Carlson, a trusted advisor with whom Kimball spoke several times in the fall of 1977. Although Kimball appeared still to be searching for an answer, he did ask Carlson, what do you think would happen if we changed the policy denying blacks the priesthood? On another visit with Carlson, Kimball said, I don't know that I should be the one doing this, but if I don't, my successor won't. During early 1978, Kimball repeatedly talked with the Quorum of the Twelve about the question. His wife Camilla recalled Kimball as thinking, I had a great deal to fight, myself largely, because I had grown up with this thought that Negroes should not have the priesthood and I was prepared to go all the rest of my life, fight for it, and defend it as it was. <clears throat> this notwithstanding, on March 23rd, after a night of reflection, he told his counselors that his impression was that the priesthood ban should be ended. After his counselors said they would support this decision, Kimball set to work to gain the concurrence of the, of the Quorum of the Twelve. On 1 June 1978, Kimball met with, the count, with his counselors and the Twelve and again brought up the possibility of conferring the priesthood upon worthy brethren of all races. A two-hour discussion followed around Kimball's belief that the priesthood ban should be ended. This later was characterized by Apostle McConkie as an outpouring of unity, oneness, and agreement. Kimball then prayed on behalf of the group, I told the Lord if it wasn't right, if he didn't want this change to come in the church, that I would be true to it all the rest of my life. But the revelatory experience which followed confirmed Kimball's belief that the ban should be ended. Whether Kimball's actions were prompted by his own long-standing concerns in 1976, he told someone he had been praying about the subject for 15 years without an answer, or by the prospects of a temple in Brazil, or by some awkward legal entanglement is not known. Personally, I think it was the developments in Brazil, perhaps facilitated by a greater understanding of the history of the priesthood ban, an understanding which afforded him 
greater latitude to act. Clearly, he felt a greater urgency to act than had any of his predecessors. I also think Kimball's son, Edward, was correct to emphasize an early Kimball observation that, quote, revelations will probably never come unless they are desired. I believe most revelations will come when a man is on his tiptoes, reaching as high as he can for something which he knows that he needs. In keeping with the long tradition of offering little or no explanation for apparent changes in doctrine, there was no official discussion of the priesthood revelation, either in 1978 or later. As I wrote in 1984, a revelatory experience was alluded to, the priesthood made available to all worthy males, and the subject quietly but firmly declared dead. Of course, the subject wasn't dead, as the traditional understanding continued to be perpetuated in, in influential Mormon publications and in the minds of many mem members. The most important of these, of course, was Bruce McConkie's Mormon Doctrine, which continued in print another 32 years. But there eventually was a quiet, unannounced evolution in leadership thinking, or at least in how the history of the subject was presented. In 2006, an indication of this came when Apostle Jeffrey Holland was interviewed by PBS and responded to questions about the Church's former teachings on blacks. At this time, if not earlier, there, were, there was a beginning effort to separate what he labeled the folklore, explaining the priesthood ban, from the ban itself. Quote, however well intended the explanations were, I think almost all of them were inadequate and or wrong. We simply do not know why that practice, that policy, that doctrine was in place. Another development came two years later in 2008 when BYU said he's carried Edward Kimball's forthright account of the development surrounding the priesthood revelation. Within this was a candid summary of the history of church teachings on blacks drawn from the scholarly work on the subject. I thought this notable because BYU studies certainly first would have obtained the concurrence of its liaison with the church's general authorities. That the old beliefs nevertheless persisted gained national attention in February 2012 when the Washington Post published an article with an explanation of the origin of the priesthood ban by BYU religion professor Randy Bott. For those who were around at the time <laughs> that he's describing, it was actually a reasonable summary of popular church beliefs back in the early 1970s. And I'll quote it, as offensive as it is to hear, uh, at least parts of it. According to Mormon scripture, the descendants of Cain, who killed his brother Abel, were black. One of the Cain's descendants was Egyptus, so a, more, a woman Mormons believed was the namesake of Egypt. She married Ham, whose descendants were themselves cursed, and in the view of many Mormons, barred from the priesthood by his father Noah. Bach points to the Mormon holy text, the Book of Abraham, as suggesting that all the descendants of Ham and Egyptus, Egyptus were thus black and barred from the priesthood. As recently as 1949, church leaders suggested that the ban on blacks resulted from the consequences of the conduct of spirits in the pre-mortal existence. As a result, many Mormons believe that blacks were, far, were less valiant in the pre-earth life or fence-sitters in the war between God and Satan, Satan. That view has fallen out of favor in recent decades. But quotes Mormon scriptures that states that the Lord gives to people all that he seeth fit. But compares blacks with a young child prematurely asking for the keys to her father's car and explains that similarly until 1978, the Lord determined the blacks were not yet ready for the priesthood. So in reality, the blacks were not having the blacks not having the priesthood was the greatest blessing God could give them. So as appalling as this was to read, especially amidst the strides being made by the church in Africa and elsewhere, I felt a little badly for Bot. He really had only presented the authoritative views of past church leaders, which views which had yet to be authoritatively disavowed. What he said was not much different from what McConkie wrote in Mormon Doctrine, which had continued in print without official censure until 2010, just two years earlier. 
Mormon doctrine still would have been sold in 2012 had not a faithful African-American member arranged to purchase the remaining 515 copies in 2010 to get them off the market. <laughs> This time, however, the church immediately issued a rebuttal, prompting, it said, by media inquiries following Bott's comments. The positions, quote, the positions attributed to BYU professor Randy Bott in a recent Washington Post article absolutely do not represent the teachings and doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For a time in the church, there was a restriction on priesthood for male members of African descent. It's not known precisely why, how, or when this restriction began in the church, but what is clear is that it ended decades ago. Some have attempted to explain the reasons for this restriction, but these attempts should be reviewed as speculation and opinion, not doctrine. The church is not bound by speculations or opinions given with limited understanding. We condemn racism, including any and all past racism, by individuals both inside and outside the church. While a useful rebuttal, the statement was a little disingenuous to my reading. In its observation, it is not known precisely why, how, and when this restriction began. And in, in its dismissal of attempts to explain the restriction as speculation and opinion, not doctrine. So we'll come back to that. In 2013, a new edition of the Doctrine and Covenants carried a new introduction to Official Declaration 2, which declaration announced the priesthood revelation. It was a little more candid and acknowledged some of the history. Quote, during Joseph Smith's lifetime, a few black male members of the church were ordained to the priesthood. Early in its history, church leaders stopped conferring the priesthood on black males of African descent. Church records offer no clear insights into the origin of this practice. Church leaders believed that a revelation from God was needed to alter this practice and prayerfully sought guidance. This revelation came to church president Spencer W. Kimball and was affirmed to other church leaders in Salt Lake Temple on June 1, 1978. The revelation removed all restrictions with regard to race that once appeared applied to the priesthood. By far, the most forthright statement came later that year. A December 2013 LES.org statement on race and the priesthood cleared by the first presidents First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve said in part, During the first two decades of, church, of the Church's existence, a few black men were ordained to the priesthood. One of these men, Elijah Abel, also participated in temple ceremonies in Kirtland, Ohio, and was later baptized as proxy for deceased relatives in Nauvoo, Illinois. There is no reliable evidence that any black men were denied the priesthood during Joseph Smith's lifetime. I'm still reading for the from the LDS.org thing. In 1852, President Brigham Young publicly announced that men of black African descent could no longer be ordained to the priesthood. Over time, church leaders and members advanced many theories to explain the priesthood and temple restrictions. None of these explanations is accepted today as the official doctrine of the church. The justifications for this restriction echoed the widespread widespread ideas about racial inferiority that had been used to argue for the legalization of black servitude in the territory of Utah. According to one view, which had been promulgated in the United States from at least the 1730s, blacks descended from the same lineage as the biblical Cain, who slew his brother Abel. Those who accepted this view believed that God's curse on Cain was the mark of a dark skin. Black servitude was sometimes viewed as a second curse placed upon Noah's grandson, Canaan, as a result of Ham, Ham's indiscretion towards his father. Although slavery was not a significant factor in Utah's economy and was soon abolished, the restriction on priesthood ordinations remained. Today, this is a concluding paragraph, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects unrighteous actions and a premortal life, that mixed race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. <laughs>
Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism, past and present, in any form. So, in contrast to 1973, for at least the past decade, Mormon historians have been consulted internally about church teachings on blacks. Their contribution is implicit in the various statements recently issued and explicit in the LDS.org statement on race and the priesthood, which also is the first on this subject to include footnotes and, and references to scholarly publications. Among these cited references have been detailed non-Mormon studies of the long since abandoned beliefs about black ancestry, the first to appear in a church issued statement. Less apparent was the contribution here again of another faithful African American member who argued successfully for the explicit disavowal of the previous justifications of the priesthood ban. Although recent church statements continue to claim that the original reason for the priesthood ban has, is not known, I wonder if anyone has asked Brigham Young. He, after all, was the one who introduced it. If he ever is asked, he will be quite clear, as he repeatedly was during his presidency. It was because African blacks were descendants of Cain. So far as I can recall, Brigham Young never said blacks, Africans, or Negroes, per se, were denied the priesthood. Rather, it was the descendants of Cain, who he believed were black Africans. Over the next century, his successors said the same thing, including the first presidency in 1949. Even the omission of this linkage from the 1969 first presidency statement appears to have reflected a public relations decision rather than a change in leadership beliefs. Just the previous year, the First Presidency had concluded that the more they said about the basis of the priesthood ban, quote, the more we shall have to explain, and that future statements, quote, should be clear, positive, and brief. <laughs> there, there were, as church spokesmen recently have claimed, some speculations after the fact speculative after the fact attempts to explain the basis for the doctrine. But these were not attempts to explain the priesthood ban per se, but rather were speculations as to why the descendants of Cain were denied the priesthood. As is well known, these primarily were hypothetical notions about the preexistence. So far as I know, no one, no matter how great, has ever been entirely free of the social and anthropological understandings of their age. It does not diminish their stature to know they believe the accepted wisdom of their day, notwithstanding this wisdom later was discredited and abandoned. This historical record shows this to be true of, near, of early Mormon leaders, which personally I find to be a good thing. It's not their global knowledge that by their global knowledge that they're to be judged, but by their global accomplishments, despite the limited understanding of their age. To me, it makes their accomplishments all the more remarkable. There are many examples in church history of ideas, even doctrines, being advanced that ultimately did not survive. Those errors occurred despite the fact that the organization led by these individuals thrived. A safe example, one of my favorites, may be that of Apostle Orson Pratt, arguably one of the brightest of the early Mormon leaders, and who was known for favoring the right of blacks to vote and for opposing Brigham Young both on the legalization of servitude and the notion that curses could extend across generations. Notwithstanding Pratt's progressive belief, beliefs in some areas, he still was very much a product of his times. In 1845, for example, he combined his understanding of Mormon theology with contemporary science to determine how much older Christ, the firstborn in spirit, was than the youngest spirit. He did this by assuming that spiritual gestation was about a year, just as it is on earth, and calculating the total number of spirits born in the preexistence. He believed that the earth would be inhabited for 8,000 years, with an average of 500 million inhabitants every 50 years. 
and that in addition to the earth's inhabitants, a third of the spirits were cast out of heaven in the pre-existence. Pratt also believed that our solar system had 30 other inhabitable planets and moons populated by the same heavenly family in proportion to the earth. Together, these assumptions <laughs> yielded a spirit population, a spirit population of one quadrillion, 20 trillion, which therefore was in years, the age differential between the first and last born. Hesitating at the magnitude of this, of these numbers, Pratt recalculated on the assumption that spirits were born at a rate of one per minute, which, which only would have taken 1,900,000,000 years, or at the rate of one per second, sort of an insect model, which, which yielded a figure, of only, a figure of only 30 million years. In fact, though, Pratt thought a short gestation period was very improbable. Pratt returned to this question in 1853, not to dismiss it, but rather to revise his assumptions. This time he limited the Earth's functional life to 7,000 years and consistent with the latest scientific thinking, disregarded any other potentially inhabited spheres. So, only 100 billion spirits were needed. With polygamy now public, he assumed these spirits were the offspring of 100 polygamous wives. So only a billion years of annual childbearing was needed. Now that was a creative mind, you know. <laughs> he, he, this isn't from some secret journal. He published this stuff, you know. <laughs> Obviously, Pratt's efforts, however serious, were not intended to establish doctrine. One has to wonder if even he found it a little preposterous. My point is that it doesn't detract from his overall brilliance to read this speculative analysis from a vantage point 160 years later. And he was far from alone. At least on the question of whether the other planets were inhabited, he could name many learned men in agreement, with the first significant challenge to this idea coming in 1853. Orson was hardly unique in his scientific speculations among, uh, among his fellow apostles either. For example, some of them worried about the physical growth of spirits, which they believed, just as an aside, were baby-sized to start with, and then adult-sized eventually, and it wasn't clear to them whether they were compressed initially or whether they grew with time, but also with their elastic properties, because he assumed that the spirit filled the whole body, and if somebody lost an arm, then there was the question of whether the spirit recoiled. <laughs> they were comfortable with that, given their science. Anyhow, an important question, perhaps only for internal leadership deliberation, is what sustained the priesthood ban for so many decades after science had discredited the popular 19th century notions that gave rise to the ban in the first place. In the hundred years prior to the priesthood revelation, church leaders repeatedly revisited the question of blacks in the priesthood. Just between 1879 and the early 1950s, there were at least 23 First Presidency or combined First Presidency Quorum of the Twelve meetings during which some aspect of the subject was discussed. Many of these involved questions about cases with some distant African ancestry. And infrequently, at least one participant argued unsuccessfully for flexibility in applying the any African ancestry exclusion. Failure to relax the so-called one drop rule stemmed both from precedent and from another lingering bit of 19th century pseudoscience. This was the non-genetic notion that racial identity could be thought of as blood and the belief that this blood could continue to be passed down through many generations and then somehow reconstitute the long-forgotten racial type of some remote ancestor. Brigham Young believed this, and so did his one-time counselor and eventual successor as church president, Joseph F. Smith. Not entering the discussion, of course, was the more recent scientific demonstrations that ultimately all human ancestry can be traced back to Africa. <laughs> 
it's not likely that this would have changed the early discussions decisions though because the modern scientific timeline is hundreds of thousands of years of human life while the church leadership was following the 7,000 year biblical model. On several occasions, the senior leadership decided that there should be a collection of previous rulings to help with future discussions. One notable insight from these collections should have been the narrow focus of the discussions. The methodology was always the same. Reliance on the statements and, dis and discussions of revered predecessors, often the First Presidency, though sometimes just the opinion of an influential apostle. Given the stature of these respected forebears, it made sense that later reviews should prayerfully consider earlier uh, decisions. In, in hindsight, however, it is apparent that no effort was made to verify the earlier claims which could have identified poor memories, nor to identify beliefs simply imported from the conventional wisdom of an earlier era. These early beliefs and the decisions they supported simply passed unchanged through successive generations of leaders. Given the extent to which indefensible 19th century beliefs had spawned and continued to justify the priesthood ban, this approach seems to me to be unfair both to the institution and to those whose dated beliefs continued to be perpetuated. How fair would it be to judge our current opinions by what is known 150 years in the future? Or why should 19th century church leaders be held to dated views? Not until the 1960s did any church leader argue to end the priesthood ban. During that decade, Hubie Brown twice proposed this during that decade, excuse me, the first time in 1963 was an unsuccessful proposal to allow the conferral of the Aaronic priesthood in conjunction with a plan to open a mission to Africa. In some ways, this was a curious idea, which I thought of as Brown's thinly disguised attempt at first step. Brown's second effort in 1969 was an attempt to end the band altogether which I think may have reflected a mistaken belief by Brown that McKay did not think the ban was of divine origin. The good news here, in my view, is that over the past decade, and especially the past few years, church statements finally reflect the involvement of historians in developing statements about church history. On the specific issue of blacks and the priesthood, what I had hoped would happen in 1973 finally has happened almost 40 years later. Of course, acknowledging a doctrinal mistake does run into the issue of infallibility, which many probably think is more important. When I was doing my research, it was apparent that the leading brethren did not believe even their most confident colleagues were infallible, even on doctrine. The evolution of doctrine, including abandonment of some once central beliefs, surely supports that notion, and the greater availability of early church records now makes this fact undeniable. Apostle Dallin Oaks has made this point quite clearly, quote, every student of church history knows that there have been differences of opinion among church leaders since the church was organized. The church leadership peri periodically has acknowledged that its prede predecessors have speculated on doctrinal subjects or simply been wrong. Dieter Uchtdorf of the First Presidency has been widely quoted for an observation he made in the October 2013 General Conference, quote, and to be perfectly frank, there have been times when members or leaders in the church have simply made mistakes. There may have been things said or done that were not in harmony with our values, principles, or doctrine. I suppose the church would be perfect only if it were run by perfect beings. God is perfect and his doctrine is pure. But he works through us as imperfect children and imperfect people make mistakes. J. Reuben Clark of an earlier First Presidency made a similar observation 60 years before when he spoke of doctrines, quote, where a subsequent president of the church and the people themselves have felt that in declaring the doctrine, the announcer was not moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Perhaps the clearest such statement came from B.H. Roberts of the First Quorum of Seventy, an intellectual albeit with his own indisputable race bias, he wrote in 1908, 
of the possibility of a church leader, quote, speaking sometimes under the influence of prejudice and preconceived notions. What limits the usefulness of these acknowledgments is that they are nonspecific and often relatively limited. For example, a statement made decades ago, or a statement of a highly speculative character. Moreover, some important church leaders deemed substantial errors to be impossible. Orson Hyde, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, observed in 1860 that to acknowledge that this is the kingdom of God and that there is a presiding power, and to admit that he can advance incorrect doctrine is to lay the axe at the foot of the tree. With God, will God suffer his mouthpiece to go into error? No. He would remove him and place another there. Brigham Young held the same view. He may go home and sleep as sweetly as a babe in its mother's arms as to any danger of your leaders leading you astray. For if they should do so, the Lord would quickly sweep them from the earth. Even the candid B. H. Roberts wrote that absolute certainty, except as to fundamental things, the great things that concern a man's salvation may not be expected. In things fundamental, we have the right to expect solid rock, not shifting sands, and God give, gives that a certainty. Robert's perspective requires a strong and consistent official record on things fundamental. No longer much talked about, this notion presently would force an unseemly argument that the priesthood ban was not a thing fundamental when it was and still is fundamental to many people. So what's left? left? Well, there is a loose end or two. To recapitulate, in the final analysis, this subject comes down to at least three fundamental questions, all of which usefully could be answered officially. First, and most importantly, what was the original basis for the priesthood ban? As I've said, to, to my way of thinking, the simplest way to answer this question is to ask Brigham Young, the man who implemented it in the first place. Young is unmistakable in answering this question, which he implicitly did almost every time he spoke on the subject. Those of African descent were descendants of Cain, and thereby ineligible for the priesthood. Closely related to this first question is why assumptions about lineage carried the case for Young, but not for Joseph Smith, who seemed to hold the same popular assumptions about black ancestry. This may be a task for the church historians, though they may not get closer to the definitive answer than already has been offered, which is that differing personal beliefs about black potential coinciding in 1847 with a very practical concern about interracial marriage and what has been termed interracial sexual excesses, and in the context of new Masonic restrictions on African American membership, led Brigham Young to reach a new conclusion. The third question of why the ban persisted, even after science discredited the old assumptions about lineage, genetics, and heredity, seems to be within the purview of the church's senior councils. As an outsider, the most obvious thing is that the many reviews that were undertaken of the subject were, until very recently, limited to what early leaders had said, with no apparent effort to use broader resources to identify potentially imported opinions. A secondary factor was that late in the history, another speculative, indirect explanation for the ban had emerged invoking the previously existence. In fact, however, the Cain connection removed the foundation, remained the foundation of the discriminatory policy while the new secondary view only provided a more comfortable pretext for church policy than invoking the increasingly anachronistic Cain justification. So there's little question in my mind where all this is heading. The historical record is clear and is now widely available that Brigham Young allowed his 19th century beliefs about Cain and 19th century concerns about racial purity to drive a decision to bar blacks from the Mormon priesthood and temple ordinances. Brigham said as much repeatedly, with no uncertainty as to why he was acting. As an aside, with the journal discourses now available on the internet, it's easy to, to show yourself that that's the case. Just go to the journal discourses and search on Brigham Young and Cain. But there are plenty of other sources that would give you the same information. Brigham may well have felt inspired in so doing, but viewed from, viewed from the more fully informed perspective of another century, he was wrong about lineage and its implications. 
That isn't Lesson Young's substantial accomplishments in establishing the Mormon kingdom in the West, or nor of successfully leading the church through some of its greatest challenges. It is still appropriate to acknowledge that on this particular question, he made a mistake. Failure to acknowledge this error leaves the impression that the church still believes the man might have been of divine origin, even if the explanations were not. That's a pretty heavy message for the Mormon black community. Back when the priesthood ban was still in effect, I used to speak to small groups, some with a few or even many African American and some African members. I walked pretty carefully through the history, thinking I didn't want to bruise anyone's testimony. What I quickly learned was that it was the white members, not the blacks, who had problems, if any, with the history. The black view tended to be, oh, so it was just a white guy thing. <laughs> yeah. What a relief. That, that made sense to them because they assumed racial bias was pretty much everywhere. What they were worried about was that God, not white guys, thought they were less worthy. A second important cost of failing to acknowledge the error is that this silence undercuts the repeated denunciation of racism made by church leaders since the priesthood revelation. Those members who seek some theological justification for their personal bias still can tell themselves that God is on their side. Church leaders will eventually acknowledge these points, perhaps even within the next decade. The groundwork certainly has been laid through the various statements published in the past few years. Given the church's acknowledgement that the ban began with Brigham Young and its rejection is myth, the explanations previously given for the ban is a relatively short additional step to admit that it was Young's belief in these myths that gave rise to the ban in the first place. I believe that a substantial portion of the church membership, including at least some general authorities, believe this already. Back in 1973, I ended my historical overview with three provisional conclusions presented in question form. and using less politically correct language since time has passed. First, do we really have any evidence that Joseph Smith initiated a policy of priesthood denial to Negroes? Second, to what extent did 19th century perspectives on race influence Brigham Young's teaching on the Negro and through him the teachings of the modern church? Third, is there any historical basis from ancient texts for interpreting the Pearl of Great Price as directly relevant to the black priesthood question? Or are these interpretations dependent upon more recent, that is, 19th century assumptions. Forty years later, the answer to all three questions is clear. The demarcation between the policies of Smith and Young has been strongly reaffirmed. No evidence has emerged that Young's decisions were derived from anything other than his belief in the Cain connection. And even the iconic Unibly has spoken against any Pearl of Great Price-based justification. Paradoxically, the church is yet to acknowledge the easiest of these questions. What evidence is there that Brigham Young's views were independent of his 19th century environment? As a cursory review of his discourses will quickly reveal, there is none. Awkward as it may be to admit this, it is past time that it be done. Had it been done 35 years ago, the story now would be old history. Hopefully, 35 years from now, it will indeed be old history. Thank you. Lester Bush would like to take questions, but a few, few guidelines. Uh, center staff have microphones, and if you put your hand up, we will give you a microphone to ask a question. We do ask the following, that you keep your questions 
short. No discourses in the questions. We also ask that once you ask the question, you release your grip on the microphone <laughs> as soon as you can. With those guidelines in place, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Are there any sources that you wish that you had been able to consult that weren't open either during the Arrington administration or that are not currently available now to study this issue? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. I, the, the, the truth is, I don't know of any other sources. I mean, is this better? Yeah. Okay. Very close. All right. Uh, Obviously, I would have liked to have known what has been learned about key black priesthood holders like Walker Lewis and, and um, others, because they were pretty important. Uh, but in terms of, I, I wouldn't say their records were hidden, you know, I, I just didn't dig in the right spot. The, the closest thing to an answer that would say yes is, I would like everything that was available in 1973 to have been available to me in 1969. It would have been a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any. I, I'll tell you that one of the key things that happened in my research, I, I wrote an article in 69 where I reviewed in laborious detail this book by Stephen Taggart that, that uh, basically proposed in some depth the so-called Missouri thesis, okay? I can be forthright in telling you that my brother subsequently at BYU had mentioned that I had written that article to the special collections uh, person and he said, well, he must have read something I'd never heard of. And, and, and so it worked out that if I'd like to come down there and take a look at them, that would be great. Well, I was overseas, but I did find a way to do that. And, and um, that's what's called, in my work, the Adam S. Binion papers. And, and I'll tell you that amongst the most useful things that I gleaned from that was that there was no other secret knowledge. I got a fuller understanding of the progression, but I had believed when I started this whole thing there's a secret cache somewhere, you know, or a hidden revelation and they're not being allowed to show or something. And it was absolutely clear that what might have been available publicly, while somewhat less robust, was every bit of the story that you could find from the internal record. Mm -hmm. Lester, can you uh, tell us what some of the consequences are of uh, revealing this sort of uh, historical record to, to you personally as, a, as an author? Uh, what kind of accolades uh, have you received as a result of this over the last 40 years? That's a complicated subject. But, you know, um, people like yourselves are very affirming, and I've, I've always had people come up and and, and say how important it was to them. And that, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I, I didn't get any letters of commendation from the church. <laughs> in fact, and as you may know, 10 years after I published that, five years after the priesthood revelation, Marty Peterson you know, called my state president because I had written that article. He, at least his dementia was not such that he didn't remember something 10 years before. And he wanted him to come take action. You know, on the, of course, the state presidency, you know, they, they talked to me about everything that I was writing, which was con a wide range of things by 1983 or 4. Then see any problem. <laughs> so that was the end. So, so the bottom line is not, I can't give you any concrete there. My question is about black women and it troubles me that we're still having this conversation and not acknowledging that 
the priesthood ban also had significant implications on black Mormon women's uh, ability to participate in temple ritual. Would you speak to that? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, up here. All right. Yeah, I'll just hook it into my... <laughs> you know, it's been a while since I really, really delved into all of the data that I have, but the... Blacks, whether they were women or men, were ultimately allowed into the temple to perform proxy baptisms. They were not allowed into the temple for anything else. And I haven't ever seen it clearly written out, but my assumption was always that the women were denied ordinances because they were considered priesthood ordinances, and somehow that hooked up to the fact that black men were not allowed uh, you know, to have the priesthood. Um, I'd have to think about this for just a minute. It, w there was a time in the 60s and in, in, in the 70s when black women, and, and, and for that matter black men, or women, were allowed to head auxiliaries at, at the ward level. And um, it was, I, I think it was a tactical decision that made it awkward to distinguish, you know, the non-priesthood holders. And I, I think in the wake of the, I may be wrong about this, I, don't quote me in any source, but I, I, I think that ended when, when the priesthood revelation came. And so in that, in that sense, it would have been harmful for women. I, I'm sorry to be floundering. I, I don't really have a good answer for you. I mean, at some point, somebody's going to write a big article, you know, about the history of women in the priesthood, and somebody already doing that. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, I, I mean, I I'm one of those who believe it's inevitable that women will eventually have the priesthood, based based on my previous familiarity. I'm not sure why they would want it. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you know, as a um, principle, you know, I'm not sure why the men would want it either. So, bottom line is that, you know, the, I, I've done stuff on medicine, as was mentioned, and on medical subjects, there's pretty clear evolution in the way church guidance progresses as a function of the way society progresses on, on those kinds of issues. And, and the path here is so clear that it, it seems impossible to me that there's not going to be a similar progression within the church. Um, I have a question. Yeah. It may, my question may fall outside the purview of your thesis or your research, but so f maybe for an informed opinion, I'm wondering what you think about the implications of the current church position on uh, racism in the Book of Mormon, uh, you know, not necessarily dealing strictly with black racism, but mm -hmm. starting in Second Nephi chapter five. Right. Well, um, that I don't particularly want to discuss the Book of Mormon, but the bottom line is that um, there's a lot of Joseph Smith in the language that goes into the Book of Mormon, and I think that um, those kinds of ideas are simply a reflection of what he would have imported. That That's as simple as that. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's really hard to judge people who lived 180 or 90 years ago in terms of what was conventional wisdom. I mean, the progressives in the 1820s and 30s held a lot of opinions that we would have considered horrific if somebody stood up and, and made the same kinds of points now. And so I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry to dodge that, but I, I don't really have a good answer for you. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, well, I, I never. Well, I haven't seen a discourse in which they did that. But as I said, I mean, and, and I think um, Paul Reeve has a book coming out that may even touch on that. I mean, clearly, Orson Pratt didn't think that a curse should pass down the line. On the other hand, and I can't remember the section of the Doctrine and Covenants, but there there is a section in there where it says, you know some heinous thing has been done and this curse will extend through all of their generations, you know, I mean, so it, it was a little bit uh, of a uh, mixed message. It, it doesn't make sense. And the reason why they speculated about the pre-existence was because they recognized that there has to be an individual issue with this person other than the fact that they're the son of somebody else. The, the closest I ever saw <coughs> Excuse me. To a an attempt, um, of a, I don't even want to say it, but a benign attempt to make that argument was a, a curious thing. I think it was Joseph F. Smith. He said, with regard to the preexistence, you know, they they had this notion, uh, as you presumably know, of patriarchal lines, you know, and they felt very strongly about lineage and everything, and, and they had this notion that people were already lined up under, you know big patriarchs in the pre-existence and that there was a whole group of, of spirits who were under Cain. This was back when he was in the pre-existence, you know, hadn't killed his brother. And um, that when he killed his brother and was cursed, they chose to remain faithful to the lineage uh, that they had chosen before. I only saw that once, but it was in a first presidency discussion. Most often it had to do with a failure to perform. That, that one was a more neutral one. So it's kind of like being true to your school, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I never believed the preset restriction, and my take on it was that I. Uh, I was not sure that we had the same God because I knew my God would never do that to me. So you mentioned that um, there was something going in Brazil that had an effect on the priesthood restriction. Can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, the, yes. Dur during that key period in the mid-70s, they were building a temple in, in Brazil. And they had many faithful black members contributing to that. Brazil, of course, was a country with a, a complex genetic situation. And, and the harder they looked, the more complex the problem was in terms of who would have access to it. But they had really faithful people who clearly were not going to have access to it who were building the temple, and, and in one leadership case, the the person, you know, like sold his wife, he and his wife sold their jewelry and uh, and made other sacrifices so that they could contribute to the construction of a temple that, by church policy, they were not going to be able to enter. And and uh, I, I'm sure, from what I read, Kimball had a great deal of angst over that. I mean, he. He, he, he was a compassionate man and an internationally oriented man, and I, I really think that's what I'm referring to. I, I think, he, as a practical matter, uh, you know, set aside what he learned about history, he, he was facing a really concrete situation that probably didn't exist meaningfully, maybe in South Africa, but not really, uh, prior to that time, where, where it, wasn't, it wasn't one of those hypothetical things like you might have found the First Presidency just having a philosophical discussion in 1890 or 1940 or something like that, 19, 1970s, it was very real. Okay? okay.
Thank you all so much for coming. And let me again remind you that our conference begins tomorrow at 8 a.m. in this building. We hope to see you all. Please drive safely. And again, thank you so much for coming.